Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, we would kindly ask that you please take your seats and silence all electronic devices as our program is about to begin. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, our program is about to begin. Thank you.
The Franklin Institute, from the very moment of its founding in 1824, resolved to honor scientific achievement and technological breakthroughs in the name of Benjamin Franklin, Philadelphia's most famous innovator. A tradition began, and it would live on with a visionary foresight, recognizing the biggest ideas, those that would grow even bigger with time, and change ordinary lives everywhere around the world. Always looking toward the next groundbreaking innovation, one of the oldest celebrations of science on Earth puts forth a sprawling narrative of human achievement. And in it, the modern world assembles one idea after the next. Tonight, we look ahead from this vantage point toward a future bound inseparably to a patchwork of climactic moments. Old stories continue and past achievements leap across generations and land firmly in the essence of new revolutions. Tonight, we see the shape of things to come. The Franklin Institute Awards. The future is written now. And now. Please welcome the 2018 Franklin Institute Laureates, escorted by their Laureate Sponsors. Anne M. Mulcahy, escorted by sponsor Michael Yusin. Philippe Horvath, escorted by sponsor Pamela Green. Manisha Rezegi, escorted by sponsor Afshin Dariush. Adrian Bajan, escorted by sponsor Gerard Jones. Vinton Gray Surf and Robert E. Kahn, escorted by sponsor Mitchell Marcus. John B. Goodenough, escorted by sponsor Christopher Murray. Susan Trumbor, escorted by sponsors David Valinsky and John Waymiller. <music> Helen Rhoda Quinn, escorted by sponsor Larry Gladney. And introducing the Franklin Institute President and CEO, Larry Dubinsky, and Chair of the Franklin Institute Board of Trustees, Don Morell. And now, celebrating 40 years at the Franklin Institute, our Master of Ceremonies, Derek Pitts. guest is the chief astronomer at the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia. Please welcome the very clever and talented Derek Pitts. Derek Pitts. Derek Pitts. Derek Pitts. Derek Pitts.
Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Franklin Institute Awards. I'm honored to be serving as Master of Ceremonies as we recognize the transformative work of this year's nine laureates. 2018 marks my 40th year at the Franklin Institute. Thank you. In four decades, I've seen much change here. I began as a museum educator, moved to overseeing the planetarium, and eventually became chief astronomer. I remember early award ceremonies when I was invited solely, I think, to ensure that the room was full enough. <laughs> it's extraordinary to see how the Franklin Institute Awards have grown in prestige and popularity over the years, thanks to the work of so many of you gathered here tonight. That growth in prestige and popularity is not only the story of this awards program, but also the story of the Institute more generally. Now, I've been lucky over the course of my career to serve as one of the voices of the Institute. I remember well the first time I was put on camera, an early afternoon in January 1986, as word spread across the country of the Challenger space shuttle explosion. While that moment marked the first of many for me in front of a microphone, speaking on behalf of the Institute, it was part of a long tradition of the press calling on us for honest answers. The Franklin Institute's role as a communicator on all things science has only evolved since then. With the ever-increasing rate at which information is shared, our voice is more in demand than ever, and not just among the press. Now, it's the broader public at events and online who are looking to us to be a source of definitive scientific information. There is, I think, no better example of this, of how the Institute does this, bringing specialist knowledge to a broad audience, than the Franklin Institute Awards. Science, technology, and engineering, each makes our lives possible, helping generation after generation realize that fact and develop a passion for learning about science and technology. That's what the Franklin Institute was, is, and will continue to be. The men and women we celebrate this evening are an exceptional lot. Taken individually, they've sparked a revolution in gene editing and brought a technology giant back from the brink. They've reshaped our understanding of the unified field theory and of climate change. They've rethought natural design and what's possible in terms of how we communicate. And they've opened the door to new technologies by way of lasers and lithium-ion batteries. Now taken together, they've paved the path to the future for the next generation of scientists and inventors. While each one of the laureates is responsible for bringing us one step closer to the future, beginning tonight, they can also claim unique membership in a community of thinkers that stretches back some 194 years into history. Tesla and Curie, Edison and Einstein, Goodall and Gates. The 2018 honorees are the latest in a line of more than 2,000 scientists, engineers, inventors, and business leaders who, after careful deliberation by their peers, have been recognized as laureates of the Franklin Institute Awards. The brilliant minds gathered here tonight are beacons of light for those of us committed to science learning and communication. It's one of my greatest privileges to have spent the last 40 years as part of the Franklin Institute family, and it is a pleasure to be here tonight to welcome such an esteemed group into that family as well. Before we meet our laureates, it's my honor to introduce the President and CEO of the Franklin Institute, Larry Dubinsky. Thank you, Derek, and congratulations on 40 remarkable years with the Institute. Tonight, 
we are proud to celebrate unparalleled achievement in science, technology, engineering, and business as part of the nation's oldest comprehensive science and technology awards program. Thank you to the laureates for joining us here this week. An amazing and energizing week it was, and congratulations to each of you. As friends of the Institute, you know just how many people it takes to make a night like tonight possible. I would like to take a few moments to offer my deepest thanks to these individuals and organizations responsible for bringing this 194th Franklin Institute Awards to life. First and foremost, our friends at Bank of America are in their 16th consecutive year as our presenting sponsor, a role that they have committed to through our bicentennial in 2024. Their support of the Institute's award ceremony and dinner is a reflection of their commitment to inspiring the next generation of innovators. Special thanks to Managing Director and Philadelphia Market President Jim Dever, to Managing Director and Market Executive for U.S. Trust and Franklin Institute Trustee Rob McMiniman, and to Senior Vice President Debbie O'Brien for their continued generosity. Thank you. I would also like to thank our Awards Week and Associate Sponsor, FS Investments, and the Associate Sponsors of tonight's event, the Danaher Lynch Family Foundation, T Connectivity, the Morrell Family Foundation, the Governor Woods Foundation, DuPont Nutrition and Health, and FMC Corporation. The guidance and dedication of the Institute's Board of Trustees, many of whom are with us tonight, are key to our success, and we are incredibly grateful for all that you do. I would also like to thank tonight's event leadership, co-chair and Institute Trustee Michael Foreman, co-chair Leanne McMiniman, Vice Chair Linda Hopcourt, and our Friends Committee and Awards Corporate Committee. I would also be remiss if I didn't single out Mia Favoranti and Tricia Maloney, along with all the other members of Michael's FS Investments team, for their tireless commitment to making the Franklin Institute Awards bigger and better with each passing year. To all of our event leadership, the 2018 awards ceremony and dinner broke fundraising records, all of which directly supports our educational programs. Thank you. And thanks to all of you, everyone taking part in tonight's celebration. Your support is what allows us to reach more than one million people annually here in this historic building and in the Nicholas and Athena Karabats Pavilion throughout Philadelphia and around the globe. For nearly two centuries, the Franklin Institute has been at the core of Philadelphia's intellectual and cultural life. We are the most visited museum in Pennsylvania and the passion for our mission among our trustees and supporters, staff and volunteers, only grows with each passing day. Now, I'd like to share with you where we're headed as we look toward the launch of the Franklin Institute's third century. For nearly two centuries, the Franklin Institute has successfully advanced a timely and far-reaching mission to inspire a passion for learning about science and technology. From discovering the beauty of the night sky in the planetarium to exploring the ventricles and valves of the iconic giant heart. From climbing through a maze of neural networks in our award-winning brain exhibit to traveling through the human body using virtual reality. Now, as we approach our landmark bicentennial anniversary in 2024, it's time not only to honor our past and celebrate who we are today, but also to reimagine our future. In June 2017, the Institute's Board of Trustees approved our new strategic plan. This plan requires us to think big, act boldly. 
Science and technology hold the solutions to many of society's most pressing challenges, from global health to cybersecurity, from sustainable energy to food production. It's our responsibility to empower children and adults with the knowledge they need to participate in informed dialogue and decision making. To realize this vision, the Institute will create a world-class visitor experience. This is our moment to push boundaries, to reinvent exhibits and interactive two-way experiences, to incorporate the latest digital technologies and those yet to come into every aspect of the museum experience. Wowing visitors and making science real and exciting. The Institute, guided by a new master plan, will re-examine virtually everything that takes place within our footprint. Many of our current programs offer a glimpse of what we have the potential to achieve as we consider new ways to make science accessible and approachable to a wider adult audience. Night skies, science after hours, educators night out, the Philadelphia Science Festival. Each of these popular offerings has reinforced the Institute's reputation as a vital voice for science. Now, at this critical time, we're ready to amplify that voice. We are determined to empower youth so that they build the sense of self and a sense of agency around science and technology. Taking the best lessons learned from the Institute's highly successful STEM scholars and PACS programs, we plan to make bold, innovative changes to reach more youth in meaningful and relevant ways. Whether they aspire to attend college or dream of a future rooted in career and technical training, the Franklin Institute will support them in fulfilling their ambitions. We're looking to you who share our passion to pursue something big, something grand, something life-changing for Philadelphia, for our region, and for our nation. Together, we can chart the course for the Franklin Institute's third century. The future is now. The future is here. Please join us. Indeed, what an exciting time it is to be part of the Franklin Institute. Working here every day for the last 40 years, and let me just answer this question that's burning in your minds right now. Yes, I did start when I was 12 years old. <laughs> I'm constantly impressed by my colleagues and the supporters that the Institute brings together. I know they're inspired by the legacy of our namesake, Benjamin Franklin, and the achievement of brilliant scientists, engineers, and entrepreneurs like the ones on our stage tonight. Without further ado, let's begin learning about this year's award winners. This story begins at the beginning of everything. This is the laboratory of particle physicist Helen Quinn, whose theories bring clarity to the earliest moments of the universe and just might illuminate one of the darkest mysteries in physics. Born just outside of Melbourne, Quinn's education began at a private girls' school comprising three classrooms surrounded by 50 acres of Australian bushland. I remember my high school math teacher telling me, Helen, you could be a mathematician because you are so lazy. <laughs> you will never do a problem the hard way. You have to find a clever way. Quinn would soon prove just how clever she was. After two years in a meteorology program at Melbourne University, Quinn followed her family to the U.S. She enrolled at Stanford and quickly changed her major to physics. Quinn earned her Ph.D. in 1967. One of the only female physicists in the world at that time, she set out to answer a perplexing question. How did the fundamental forces of nature come to be? There are four fundamental forces in the universe. Gravity, which you can feel pulling you down into your chair, the electromagnetic force, which binds the atoms in your chair together so you don't fall through, the strong force, which holds the atom's nucleus together, and the weak force, responsible for radioactive decay. Quinn focused on three of these. 
The weak force, the strong force, and the electromagnetic force have very different strengths, but they have the same mathematical structure. And so it's very tempting to think of them of different aspects of a single type of force. Physicists had been trying to unify the forces for years. Working with Benjamin Franklin medalist Steve Weinberg and Howard Georgie, Gwynn turned back the clock to the beginning of time. She ran mathematical simulations of the three forces in high energy conditions, like those just after the Big Bang. What she discovered became a physics milestone. Quinn found that at high energies, the forces of nature begin to behave as one. In other words, Quinn's work suggests a single unified force created the universe and then split apart into the forces that shape everything we see today, making great progress towards a solution even Einstein struggled to uncover in his lifetime. But Quinn wasn't done. She became fascinated by another mystery of the early universe. The Big Bang created matter and its mirror opposite, antimatter. When matter collides with antimatter, the two atoms explosively annihilate each other. Because the Big Bang created matter and antimatter in perfectly equal amounts, there should be nothing left of either today. However, this isn't the case. The universe is filled with regular matter and no antimatter. Quinn knew this could only happen if the laws of physics for matter and antimatter were somehow different. And your intuition based on everyday experience isn't worth very much for doing particle physics. This led Quinn to predict a new particle called the axion, potentially one of the biggest discoveries in physics history. We've studied the rotation of galaxies for decades, and one thing is clear. They all rotate in a way that only makes sense if there is more matter in galaxies than we can see. Scientists call this unseen matter dark matter and we don't know what it is yet. Quinn's axion could be the answer we've been looking for, and if the particle is found in future experiments, the axion would become one of the most important discoveries in history. And the, the most fascinating, in fact, is that thinking about the smallest things links to thinking about the biggest things. Now retired from Stanford, Quinn works to bring sweeping change to science education promoting women in science as well as new programs and methods of teaching science content to the generations that will further her research. Her efforts cap off 50 years of discoveries which have sprouted new branches of particle physics, inspired experiments that may still revolutionize our understanding of nature, and brought detail to the narrative of the most climactic moments in all of history. The beginning of everything. Ladies and gentlemen, the recipient of the Benjamin Franklin Medal in Physics, Helen Rhoda Quinn. Susan Trumbor's career mixes science with adventure. She's as comfortable in remote regions of the jungle as she is handy with a mass spectrometer. And she's combined both of those talents over decades of globetrotting hot on the trails of the most potent greenhouse gas. I read a lot of adventure books and as a girl, None of the books were about me. I decided I still wanted to have all those adventures myself, <laughs> and uh, why not? From the high Sierra Nevada mountains to the frozen Antarctic to the steamy Amazon jungle, Susan Trumber's lab is planet Earth. Part adventurer, part detective, part techno wizard, Trumber has crossed all seven continents, tracking the elusive movements of the element fueling climate change. The teacher went around the room and he asked each one of us what we wanted to be. My answer was, I want to be a cosmochemist, you know, <laughs> which was kind of a nerdy answer for a ninth grade girl to give. He looked at me and he said, you're gonna be the first woman on Mars. There are lots of things a high school teacher could have said to a child who was so nerdy, <laughs> and, but uh, that was the most encouraging thing I could possibly have heard. Today, the presiding director of the Max Planck Institute for Biogeochemistry captains a world-class facility dedicated to researching what scientists call... The carbon cycle 
is basically the way we explain how a single carbon atom can move from the atmosphere into the biosphere, into living plants and animals and soils, and then back out to the atmosphere. When scientists talk about human-induced climate change, carbon, a greenhouse gas, is the culprit. Now in the 1970s, climate scientists knew that the oceans, which cover about 70% of Earth's surface, absorbed carbon naturally, scrubbing it from the air. But at the time, nobody had attempted to research how Earth's land masses absorbed and emitted carbon, meaning roughly 30% of the picture was missing. For most scientists, tracing carbon atoms from the air, through the soils, animals, vegetations, entire ecosystems, seemed too monstrous a task. Trumber saw a globe-trotting adventure. But to document how much carbon the continents were absorbing and storing, she needed timestamp, something that could reveal when a single atom of carbon clocked into the land. Trumber found the perfect tool in carbon dating. Every day, radiation from space converts stable nitrogen atoms in the atmosphere into radioactive carbon atoms called carbon-14. When plants take in carbon dioxide, carbon-14 hitches a ride into the land. Now, Nature produces roughly the same amount of carbon-14 each year. So the amount entering the soil today should be the same amount as a century ago. But... The nuclear age of the 1950s and 60s marks a time when humankind decided to forego its radioactive annuity and opt for a one-time, Geiger-ticking, straight-to-the-atmosphere lump sum of radioactive isotope carbon-14. Everybody exploded their biggest bombs. Most of the carbon-14 came from a couple of the really big explosions just before the test ban treaty. This megadose of carbon-14 spread across the atmosphere and seeped into just about everything everywhere, all at once. Trumber, an expert with carbon-detecting particle accelerators, had her timestamp. Trumber traced carbon-14 through leaves, root systems, and into soils, painting an unprecedented and complex picture of carbon absorption across the continents. Ultimately, the girl who dreamt of adventure and found it in carbon has another message. I think the one thing that unites us as human beings is we're all scientists when we're kids, right? We're all curious about our world, and I think just keeping that spirit alive somehow, if we can discover a way to keep that, then I think the human race is in good shape. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the recipient of the Benjamin Franklin Medal in Earth and Environmental Science, Susan Trumbor. Cameras, smartphones, and tablets. If not for John Goodenough, our pockets and purses would all be much lighter, and the devices that connect us would be tied to our electrical outlets. This is the world without the lithium-ion battery, the power source that's mobilized humankind. I worked hard because I was dyslexic and I was trying to cover it up. And so I started out at the very bottom of the of my class of 30. Born in 1922 to American parents in Yenna, Germany, John Goodenough grew up outside of New Haven, Connecticut, dyslexic, struggling to read. Still, he'd soldier through high school beating dyslexia only to see the prospect of college stolen by war. Sometime after high school, on an academic field trip in the mountains of Norway, Goodenough was with six German friends as they received their draft notices. And I shook my hand to them and wished them well and said, well, I'm sorry, but I have to fight on the other side. But the end of World War II brought a long-awaited change of fortune. Goodenough was selected by the Army as one of 21 veterans to study physics at the University of Chicago. Of course, the registration officer took one look at me and he said, I don't understand you veterans. Don't you know that anybody had ever done anything interesting in physics? Had done it by the time he was your age? And you want to begin? Goodenough accepted the challenge. He entered university with only $35 to his name and left in 1952 with a PhD and one of the best minds for electron physics in the world. That's how I officially became a chemist. <laughs> he wound up at MIT's Lincoln Lab, where over the next decade, he'd help invent one of the first forms of computer memory. And after that, took a position at Oxford University and turned his attention to batteries. It was at the end of the 1960s 
when the first energy crisis was about to occur. Looking at a world of diminishing fossil fuels, Goodenough wondered, could he build a battery better than existing ones? A battery has three parts, two metal-based electrodes and a barrier material separating them. When the battery is connected to a device, positively charged particles called ions pass through the barrier. This frees up negatively charged electrons, which have to flow through the device to get to the low energy side. That's your electricity. When the last electrons have left the high energy side, the battery is dead. How long a battery lasts depends largely on the chemical structure of the high energy metal. And in the late 1970s, Goodenough was looking into lithium, a metal with special properties scientists thought could produce a stronger battery with a life longer than anything available at the time. But Goodenough faced a serious challenge. At the time, all batteries were manufactured in a charged state. The battery rolls out of the factory ready and waiting to power your electronics. But lithium was unstable if made this way. Goodenough found a revolutionary solution that challenged the status quo. He realized that he could make a stable lithium battery if it was manufactured in a dead state. It could be brought to life with a simple charge. Goodenough's designs produced a rechargeable battery so strong and with such a long life that manufacturers changed their ways. The entire industry responded with innovation. And in 1991, Sony released the world's first lithium-ion battery using Goodenough's materials, making possible cameras, laptops, tablets, and phones, the portable devices that untethered humankind from our electrical outlets and put the power of modern electronics into hands and pockets around the world. While the lithium-ion battery is still revolutionizing the way we live and travel, Goodenough feels it's time for the next advancement. At 95 years old, he goes to work each day faithful that the ingenuity and will exists to realize an Earth free from its dependence on fossil fuels. I don't want man in his greed to exploit the resources of Earth to turn what should be a garden into a desert. Ladies and gentlemen, recipient of the Benjamin Franklin Medal in Chemistry, John B. Goodenough. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce Jim Dever, Market President of Bank of America, the presenting sponsor of the Franklin Institute Awards Ceremony and Dinner. Jim? Thank you, Derek. Good evening. It is my privilege to be with you tonight and to speak to you about Bank of America and our commitment to the Franklin Institute Awards. The nine men and women recognized tonight embody the word dedication. Each in their own way has left a lasting mark on their field and on the world. It is an absolute honor to celebrate them this evening. As you heard earlier, this is Bank of America's 16th consecutive year sponsoring the Franklin Institute Award Ceremony and Dinner. Bank of America, much like the Institute, works in Philadelphia and across the country to help people achieve their dreams and create positive change in the places they live. Bank of America supports this historic program, not only because we want to celebrate the 2018 laureates, but also because we are committed to bolstering the work that happens here day in and day out. The Franklin Institute sparks curiosity about science and technology in children and adults. It offers STEM learning opportunities to teenagers from the region's most under-resourced communities. And it stands as one of the world's leading science centers. We at Bank of America are proud to partner with the Franklin Institute in these efforts and more. It is for that reason that we have agreed to be the presenting sponsor of the Franklin Institute Awards Ceremony and Dinner through their 200th anniversary in 2024. I thank all of you for, for being here tonight and offer our heartfelt congratulations to all of the laureates. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Now let's learn about the work of four more of our distinguished laureates. 
messages, transactions, movies, and TV. Right now, billions of computers, billions of computers around the globe are exchanging data, each one using a communications protocol so resilient that it still powers the internet four decades later. This is the work of Vint Cerf and Bob Kahn, two fathers of the internet. The internet. It ranks among the most world-changing inventions. And it's the product of one of the most famous collaborations in the history of computer science. So what's interesting about working with Bob is that sometimes he's absolutely infuriating. And, 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 and now, now you tell me. The internet has no single inventor, but Vint Cerf and Bob Kahn, known worldwide as two fathers of the internet, designed the backbone of our connected planet. The method that allows computers to communicate. So I had a too creative a mind um, for most uh, normal parents. But, uh, you know, I'd get up in the morning and ask for some um, you know, S-T-I-T-A-H-W, and they would look at me and say, well, what's that? And, of course, if you played it backwards, you'd say I was asking for Wheaties. My best friend across the street, he and I made nitroglycerin. Uh, it was pretty stupid, actually. We, good thing we didn't blow each other up. Surf and Khan weren't typical kids, so it's no surprise that their career paths weren't typical either. When Cerf, a programmer from UCLA, and Khan, a communications expert and electrical engineer from Princeton, entered the field of computer networking in the 1970s, few computer networks existed. One of the most advanced was called the ARPANET, a government-funded attempt to link computers manufactured with wildly different hardware. And it worked, slowly. Data was sent between computers in short bursts or packets, a revolutionary method of computer communication pioneered by Franklin Institute medalist Paul Barron. Though, with the different computers on the ARPANET, packet switching was slow. Think of packets as postcards with room enough for only a single word each. Now imagine the ARPANET computers as islands connected by a postal service that only delivers postcards. Let's say you want to send a short sentence to your friend on another island, another computer. If you mailed four postcards, there's no guarantee the postcards will actually arrive. And if they do, they may not arrive in the same order they were sent. Communication between ARPANET computers was slow. Surf and Khan set out to improve the system, hoping to realize a network that could send long messages quickly and reliably. Working in tandem over long nights, the pair overhauled the packet delivery system. Surf and Khan kept the post office concept, but imposed a set of rules or protocols on senders and recipients. First, you would number your postcards so your friend could put them into the correct order. Second, your friend would return a message reporting the numbers she received. If you didn't hear back from your friend, you would keep sending copies until receipt was acknowledged. This is how the internet works. Surf and Khan called the rules transmission control protocol slash internet protocol or TCP IP. And using it, computers constructed with different hardware schemes could suddenly communicate quickly and reliably. The internet was born. TCP IP is so successful and so efficient that more than 40 years later, it's still powering the internet, allowing for almost every major innovation on the web, from text-only electronic messages to email attachments, streaming music, high-resolution movies and TV, and instant access to the collective knowledge of humankind None of it would be possible without Surf and Khan and the groundbreaking protocol that changed the world. The collaboration has been terrific over a very long period of time. So we're problem solvers and you know, we enjoy that. We're engineers and that's what engineers like to do. Just give us a problem and we'll go figure out how to solve it. Ladies and gentlemen, recipients of the Benjamin Franklin Medal in Computer and Cognitive Science, Vinton Grace Surf and Robert E. Kahn. Maybe I was just as excited for them as uh, they were. <laughs> From the forking of river basins to the branching of trees, to the structure of corporate hierarchy. According to Adrian Bejan, the designs we find repeating in the world are no coincidence. 
Rather, they reveal something deep and fundamental about the world around us. From a young age, I have been captivated by the elegant expressions of the natural world. I would develop a new understanding of evolutionary phenomena and the oneness of nature. I offer a new theory for the history of Earth and what it means to be alive. My name is Adrian Bejan, and everything is evolution. Pay attention to nature and you'll quickly find designs arising in the smallest places and repeating across space and time. Romanian-born professor Adrian Bijan sees no coincidences. He's shown that the shape of everything, including you, your smartphone, and even social systems, emerges from the deep forces of the universe. And he's proving it in a big way with a theory of fundamental physics called constructal theory. For a finite uh, size flow system to persist in time, it must evolve so that it provides easier access to its currents. End of statement. Sounds technical, so let's back up. <laughs> now further. I mean, really lean into it. Too far, too far, too far! Much better. I was uh, trained in, um, in how to draw and also how to develop an appreciation for ideas in uh, the visual arts and beauty and uh, discipline. At his father's insistence, Adrian Pijan grew up studying science and math by day and art after hours beginning at the age of five. After two decades, which included a short career on the Romanian national basketball team, Pijan would graduate from MIT with a degree in mechanical engineering and he never put down his sketch pad. Here's the cat, Adrian's cat, in the book of Theronemics. I also have a dog. In 1995, while teaching at Duke University, Bijan applied his artist's eye to designs for a cooling system intended for laptop PCs. He intuitively predicted that a branching architecture like this would most easily transport heat away from a laptop's processor, and it worked. Two years later, Bijan realized his old design was similar to tree-like or arborescent structures that appear in nature. I was not mimicking nature. I was actually predicting nature. But no written principles describe what Bijan says he knew intuitively from years of training in engineering. Bijan believes he had stumbled upon a fundamental law of physics. Constructal theory begins with flow. In science, flow means the transportation of stuff from place to place. And in nature, the things that keep stuff flowing tend to stick around longer. This laptop is a good analogy. If the design of the cooling system doesn't keep heat flowing away from the processor, it builds and builds until the whole system dies. Along with the design for the cooling system, the same is true in nature. Vegetation, lightning, blood vessels, river basins. Constructal theory moves us into a reality where form emerges from the forces of nature and assembles to design a universe of flow. And almost everything flows, including us. Internally, our bodies flow. Externally, we flow over time as a species. Our culture flows too. Knowledge, tradition, data. All of it flows in constructive form, supported by art, languages, technology. Designs evolving to improve and maintain the flow. Constructal theory puts humankind and everything we create at one with nature. And because nature is predictable, we can put constructal theory to work for our benefit. Bijan has already begun. Today, Bijan's ideas are being embraced by corporations working to increase efficiency, by engineers designing new technology, by artists interpreting the newfound relationship between form and flow. Which brings us to a mind-bending conclusion. Because knowledge of Bijan's constructal theory is improving the flow of humankind, Designs, like this film, have emerged to spread knowledge of it, all according to constructal theory, making it the only theory in the history of physics to produce a film about itself. Think about it. Ladies and gentlemen, the recipient of the Benjamin Franklin Medal in Mechanical Engineering, Adrian Bejan. To Manager Rezeghi, the modern world is one big laser light show. 
The lasers engineered in her lab power the transcontinental internet and airport security systems. But the mind behind what is likely the most sophisticated quantum engineering lab in the world is far from finished. Iranian-born physicist Manisha Razigi has already changed the world with the laser that carries the internet under the sea and the new tech inside airport body scanners. But she's not finished. He said, my gosh, please, wait, don't kill me. Let me to finish to see the result before to go home. The unique forms of light created in Razigi's world-class quantum devices lab at Northwestern University are about to power two more world-changing technologies, a super-speed wireless internet and a laser that can make explosives shine through luggage and clothes. So I get married at the age of uh, the 15 years old. I got my high school with the three children, but at the same time, continuing exactly and never missing even one hour, neither from school nor from my duty as a mother. Rizegi never gave up on education, and by her early 20s, against unbelievable odds, the mother of three was studying nuclear physics at Tehran University on a path to change the world with laser light. What's the difference between a radio wave, a microwave, and sunshine? Believe it or not, it's all the same stuff, light, photons moving through space. But here's the difference. Notice this photon oscillating as it travels. The faster the oscillation, the higher the frequency. That's it. Radio waves, visible light, x-rays, and beyond, everything on the electromagnetic spectrum from left to right is just light moving at increasing frequencies. We use different frequencies of light to transmit wireless data. Now here's a key point. Higher frequencies generally mean faster wireless data speeds. So how fast can we go? Gamma waves have the highest frequency. They could allow downloading of thousands of full-length movies a second. But whoops, all light rays from gamma down to UV damage our bodies and don't travel well in the atmosphere. So what's left? Well, forget visible light, that's the sun's territory. And we're already broadcasting on these slower frequencies, so transmitting faster than we transmit today leaves us here, below infrared, but above microwaves, in a section called the terahertz spectrum. In the 1980s, producing terahertz light signals could only be done with an ultra-cold temperature laser, impractical for communications outside of a research facility. Many scientists thought this was the end of the line for terahertz communication. Working at the Exploratory Materials Lab at defense contractor Thompson CFS in Orsay, France, Rizigi thought otherwise. It's all of the, the secret of the science is in the periodic table. And that's exactly where she turned. Using a semiconductor called indium phosphide, she eliminated the need for cold temperatures, shocking her colleagues with a room temperature laser that made terahertz transmission practical for the first time. They said that in one year you are going to become famous in the world. Everywhere they wanted to have me, especially, especially in the United States, for this technique because it was changing everything. Currently, a German laser system based on Rizigi's work operates at a speed capable of transmitting roughly 13 HD feature films in a second. But there's more. Just as X-ray light penetrates most soft tissue and bounces off hard bone, some terahertz frequency light penetrates suitcases and makes explosives shine. Pioneered in Rizigi's lab, devices smaller than a shoebox can see bombs and other volatile chemicals in luggage and beneath clothes. These devices can be made cheaply and are easily installable at airports, on buses, and subways, and at stadium turnstiles. After more than 30 years of engineering groundbreaking quantum devices, Rizigi is still riding the waves toward future discoveries, propelled by the same sources of energy that have fueled one of the most impressive careers in communications physics. Curiosity, curiosity, passion. That's it. To have, really, again, passion for to understand something and the curiosity. That's the two elements. Nothing else. Ladies and gentlemen, the recipient of the Benjamin Franklin Medal in Electrical Engineering, Manage Rizegi.
It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Donald Morell, chair of the Institute's Board of Trustees and a longtime passionate supporter of the awards program. Don? Thank you very much, Derek, and good evening, everyone. Uh, before my formal comments, I hope you'll allow me a little comedic license and start out with what's been probably you know, a great four months for our city. There was this event a little while ago where we had a number of spontaneous collisions resulting in a series of parabolic flights of an oblate spheroid, giving us a numerical advantage over those guys from New England. <laughs> yes, we won the Super Bowl. And of course, that was followed up on April 2nd by Villanova winning its second championship in three years. And all that did was act as a prelude to the serious subject of tonight, which is honoring our laureates on one of the great events in the city. But the real stuff starts tomorrow when we kick off Science Festival for more than 100,000 of our citizens over a week to generate passion and curiosity about science. So I hope you'll all take the time to join us for that. So it's my pleasure on behalf of the trustees of the Franklin Institute to add my welcome to everyone here tonight as we recognize the scientific contributions and business achievements of the 2018 Franklin and Bauer laureates. Tonight's ceremony would be impossible were it not for the hard work of the Committee on Science and the Arts, chaired by Professor C.J. Taylor of the University of Pennsylvania, the Bauer Business Award Selection Committee, chaired by Professor Michael Yusim of the Wharton School, and the International Selection Committee for the Bauer Award for Achievement in Science, chaired by Board Trustee Dr. Paul Offit of the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Please join me in thanking these gentlemen and all committee members for their dedication to preserving and advancing the more than 190-year legacy of the Franklin Institute Awards Program. We are also fortunate to be joined this evening by a number of our past medalists. I would now like to invite them to stand and ask you to join me in a round of applause in recognizing these remarkable individuals. At last year's ceremony, Larry and I told you about the work underway to lay the foundation for the Franklin Institute's 200th anniversary in 2024. And earlier this evening, you heard about our ambitions for the future. As Institute staff, trustees, and stakeholders completely reimagine the visitor experience for our third century, an experience that will be immersive, will be fun and educational and thought-provoking, whether it's virtual or physical. All those who work here are honored to steward this remarkable institution into a new era. The Franklin Institute's mission to inspire a passion for learning about science and technology is more relevant and pressing today as current and future generations rely more heavily on technology for economic opportunity, for communication, and almost all aspects of our daily lives. Indeed, rapid advances in technology bring both opportunity and risk, as is illustrated by recent events around data privacy and the future ethical use of genetic editing to treat inherited diseases. For almost two centuries now, the Franklin Institute has boldly embraced its role as a resource where people of all ages and backgrounds can come to understand the science behind these and other critical issues so that they can make more informed decisions. As we at the Institute plan for our third century, we are committed to broadening and deepening the important role the Franklin Institute plays in communicating the positive impact science and technology have on our world. By joining us here tonight and supporting the Franklin Institute, you honor the remarkable legacy of Benjamin Franklin and play a part in ensuring that the Institute will continue to thrive. To my fellow trustees and committee members, our community partners, our corporate sponsors, staff, and volunteers, Thank you for your time, your energy, your passion and support, all of which are critical in allowing us to advance the mission of the Franklin Institute. And congratulations to our 2018 laureates. You are the inspiration to us and especially the young generation of scientists and engineers and entrepreneurs who will no doubt look to your work as they pick up the torch of inquiry and innovation and in carry it through to the 21st century. 
Emerson once said, nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm. With your support, your passion, energy, and enthusiasm, we will do great things in the years ahead. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Don. Now let's learn about our final two laureates this evening. What began as a moment of curiosity for dairy researcher Philippe Horvath has become a defining moment for mankind. The future of our biology is now firmly in our hands. With tools derived from Horvath's research into a genetic phenomenon called CRISPR, we can edit our own DNA more precisely and easily than ever before. 2002. A battle rages in the lab of a dairy research facility in Dans saint romain France. The bacteria that produce the world's cheeses and yogurts struggle to resist an invading virus seemingly taken from a nightmare. The phage virus, harmless to humans, deadly to the fermentation bacteria that support the dairy industry. In the aftermath of the lab, only bacteria with phage virus immunity survive. Like many times before, the immune bacteria will be cultivated and sold to dairy producers to protect against outbreaks that could devastate the global supply of yogurt and cheese. But only after a short detour. This time, researcher Philippe Horvath follows through on a hunch. He examines the DNA of one of the surviving bacteria. What he finds is a world-changing tool that promises humankind the extraordinary ability to easily edit our own DNA. So I believe I am perceived as a perfectionist, which is often considered a drawback. Not for Horvath. The son of a seamstress and a toolmaker, he spent his high school years in Colmar, Alsace, perfecting the only thing that mattered to a teenager in the 1980s, solving a Rubik's Cube in 30 seconds. After completing his PhD at Louis Pasteur University in Strasbourg, France, Horvath went to work at Danesco, a dairy research lab eventually purchased by DuPont. This put Horvath on the front lines in the war against the phage virus. August 2002. Horvath attends a biology conference where he spots a poster depicting a familiar bacteria used in yogurt and cheese. The poster describes cryptic, repeating sequences in the bacteria's DNA. In the 1980s, biologists had been fascinated by mysterious repeating sequences in the DNA of some bacteria. Small clusters of sequences appear over and over again, like this separated by strings of seemingly random code called spacers. Scientists dubbed the phenomenon CRISPR. The most important word in CRISPR is the last uh, R, which means repeats. Over the decades, attempts to puzzle out the meaning of CRISPR sequences ultimately fall short. Horvath and his team begin their own research. Hunched over a readout of CRISPR sequences, he stumbles quickly upon a realization. The cryptic message isn't in the repeating sequences. It's the stuff in between. What seems random to others, Horvath recognizes almost instantly. Shockingly, the spacer sequences in bacterial DNA are actually genetic signatures of phage viruses. It's exactly a memory based on DNA of uh, former uh, encounters with, uh, with viruses. This was a landmark discovery. If a bacterium survives a phage infection, the bacterium embeds a signature of the virus directly into its DNA. Later, when a new phage injects its DNA into the bacterium, a special protein armed with the CRISPR sequences reads the virus's genetic material. If it finds a match, the protein uses molecular scissors to precisely snip the sequence within the phage DNA, disabling it and stopping the infection. Incredibly, other researchers have shown that this editing process can be adopted and used to edit any kind of DNA, including human. Armed with a target DNA sequence and inserted into human or other cells, the scissoring protein can precisely snip and remove any segment at will. Scientists inject a custom segment of replacement DNA and the cell naturally puts everything together again. This is poised to be a game changer in our approach to curing disease. In the future, doctors might be able to edit genetic diseases like cystic fibrosis, hemophilia, and anemia, not just from a single patient's DNA, but for all the future generations. But with this new technology, our society will also have important choices to make, like when is it right to use it, and who will get to decide. The CRISPR-based gene editing tools derived from their work are changing the rules of biology. 
And to be fair, these just might be the most important discoveries to come from the pursuit of endless cheese. Ladies and gentlemen, the recipient of the Bauer Award and prize for achievement in science, Philippe Horvath. Known around the world for its copies, there is only one Xerox Corporation. Likewise, there is only one Anne Mulcahy, the longtime Xerox employee turned CEO who became both inspiration and role model to future business leaders everywhere after her astonishing save of one of the oldest U.S. companies. You know, I had a conversation with Warren Buffett once. He said, you gotta be battle ready and resilient. And I think I kind of took on that mantle that, you know, this was worth fighting for. In high school, Anne Mulcahy had a different kind of homework. Each night, she was encouraged to participate in debates with her family members in their Rockville Center home in New York. You basically had to come prepared to talk about current events. So you had to read the newspaper, and the more controversial it was, the better. So um, you, you really, you had to be prepared. It, it was just great training. I learned early on how to have a voice, and that never left me. Shortly after completing a degree in journalism, Mulcahy tried to spin that voice into a writing career, but wasn't able to support herself on a young writer's salary. So she accepted an entry-level sales position at a company renowned for revolutionizing workflow in businesses around the world, the Xerox Corporation. Copy machines, typewriters, yeah, absolutely. Door to door, cold call after cold call. This was the beginning of one of the most exceptional climbs up the corporate ladder in Xerox's history. By 2000, Mulcahy, having worked in nearly every department, was vice president of human resources. But Xerox had lost its way. Yeah, it was, it was not good. Someone um, once described to me that we didn't launch products, they escaped. Xerox was looking for a new CEO. Mulcahy was briefly considered by the board, but ultimately she was passed over for outside talent. 18 months later, he was gone. There was nobody following. And what they really needed was an aligned organization. So um, they turned to me as an insider at that point. Investors sent Xerox a clear message. The day Mulcahy was named CEO, the stock price plummeted. They clearly were not pulling in my direction, so, um, you know, it became personal. Mulcahy was handed the reins to a Xerox in crisis. It was losing money, facing bankruptcy, and to top it off, the SEC was investigating the accounting department. Mulcahy stood before her only support base, the employees at Xerox, and did what she had trained to do since high school. She presented an argument that the company needed to change. Thinking about your business in terms of, you know, motivating a workforce is, for me, one of the most important aspects of leadership. I had the support of Xerox people 100%. It was extraordinary. Mulcahy rapidly put into effect a new vision for Xerox, one that engaged its customers with technology consulting services. She eliminated antiquated product lines and doubled down investments into innovation relevant to a digital age. Something that someone had said to me which really helped was that for all the tough decisions that you make, put them through the lens as if they were going to be a headline in the New York Times. Turns out, it was good advice. When Mulcahy had taken the reins, Xerox was losing more than $300 million a year. Four years later, it was bringing in over a billion. Mulcahy had resurrected a giant. After 10 years as chairman and CEO, Mulcahy retired. Today, life is different. She spends her time working with Save the Children, as well as investing in mentoring small businesses that promote women in leadership roles. Though one thing is inarguably the same. For the friends that have known me the longest, they'd say that the essence of Anne Mulcahy has never changed, <laughs> for good or for bad. But most people, they know what to expect with me.
Ladies and gentlemen, the recipient of the Bauer Award for Business Leadership, Anne M. Mulcahy. Ladies and gentlemen, the nine laureates before you have transformed our world, and their work will no doubt inspire many others to follow in their footsteps. Please join me in congratulating the 2018 Franklin Institute laureates. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the award ceremony for the 2018 Franklin Institute Laureates. We now invite you to make your way to dinner in the Institute Galleries. Please reference your ticket to find your dining room and enjoy the rest of your evening. Good night. <laughs>